All right, well, today we're going to be in a very awesome passage of Scripture. Right here in the middle of Romans, we're going to be journeying, a quick journey, through Romans 3 and 4 and even one verse from chapter 5. We're not going to cover it all, but the point of what we will be looking at today is what saves. In other words, what a comfort it is to us as believers to be reminded of what saves. We often talk about grace like it's a concept that we're already in and already under. We are under grace and we are standing in grace for sure. But how did we get here? And can we somehow lose our position? Can we lose this place in which we reside, this place called grace? As you discuss the gospel with your friends and relatives, what is it that you say concerning the gate, concerning the doorway, concerning the entrance into this life of grace? How did you arrive at this place? This place of safety and security and understanding and wisdom in Christ Jesus, it is awesome to be in the room but what does the doorway look like? Of course, Jesus said, I am the gate. He said, I am the door. And he told us to enter through him, and it was a narrow gate. And I wonder if we might need to ponder the wide gate for a moment. The wide gate, the one that many perceive to be the right one, is the works righteousness gate, the doorway of what I do. It is a do and do and do doorway. And many religions around the world teach us the way of doing. They offer us a, a pathway to rightness with God and salvation by what we are doing, by how we are working for God. But today in this scripture passage, the God of the universe is going to take that and he's going to turn it on its ear. He's going to show us a different way. We begin in Romans 3 verse 19. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law so that every mouth may be closed and all the world may become accountable to God. I want you to notice a few things. First of all, remember what the law is. The law is a way of doing. The law is a way of working. The law says, if you do this, God will do this. Now, uh, we see the purpose of the law here. And it can be summed up in two words. Shut up. That got your attention, didn't it? The law silences every single person. It speaks to those who are under the law so that every mouth may be shut up. Because when 613 demands are staring you in the face, the only wise thing to say is nothing at all. And this is the purpose of the law. The law is saying to you, if you believe that you can get right by doing, then the standard is not this high or this high, but the standard is indeed all the way up here, and there's no way you can achieve it. And so the law shuts us up and makes us all accountable to God. We say concerning that standard, wow and no way. And then the law has done its work because by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. Instead, what does the law do? For through the law comes what? Not a great hope, but the knowledge of sin. The law does its work when it shows me my problem. Those Old Testament commands, 613 of them, they're designed to show me my problem so that I seek a solution. But you'll notice that in the way of doing, in the way of working, in the way of earning, in the way of trying, exactly zero people are justified. Notice that? By the works of the law, no person, not a single human on this planet, will be made right. So do we understand the word justified? It means to be put in right standing. It means to be made right with God. It means to be forever connected to him. That when he looks at us, he sees perfection because that's what he needs to see. How can I get into that position where I'm seen as perfect? How can I get into that position where he relates to me uh, from this place of perfection that he has made me perfect with him? 
Well, the first thing we learn here is it's not by doing. Now, of course, we've heard this. Maybe some of us have heard this since we were this high. Nevertheless, do you truly believe, are you honestly on board with the fact that you could sin a billion times and all of that bad behavior is unrelated to your status with God? Until we get to that place, we haven't understood faith righteousness. That's where we're going today, that rightness with God is by believing, that rightness is by faith, that rightness is by faith alone. And so until I reach that radical moment where I see that even if I were to sin billions and billions and billions of times, and I know you, some of you have, (laughs) we all have sinned uncountable, unmeasurable times, and that's the whole point Rightness cannot be by our doing. It cannot be by our trying. It must be by our trusting. And so he is announcing here that by the way of works, by the way of doing, by the way of trying, not one single human being will be made right with God. Instead, all we become acquainted with is our problem. I now have a knowledge of my sins. Wow, what do I do about this? And so the announcement is this, verse 21, Now, apart from the law, apart from works, apart from doing, apart from trying, the righteousness of God has been shown, it's been manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. All of the Old Testament figures, all of those who tried their very hardest, are now witnesses of this incredible way of faith alone. Even the rightness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe, for there is no distinction. So you notice that this rightness, this rightness is, is first of all, it's of God. So if God is going to make you right, then how right are you? If God has made you right, then how right do you become? If you were going to measure God's ability to make you right, What would you conclude about his ability, his capability to put you in right standing? So you see there is a bragging, but the bragging is not about what you're doing. The bragging is about what God has done. Look how competent my God is to make me right and what a job he has done. And so the righteousness is not some generic rightness. It is actually the rightness of God that is shared with us. We become as right as Jesus Christ is right. There is no lesser rightness. See, you're either right or you're wrong. You're either righteous or you're unrighteous. On a scale of 1 to 10, there's a 0, in fact. There is no 1. Scale of 1 to 10, there's a 0 or a 10. It's perfection. And so the rightness of God comes by what? Well, it says here, by faith. By faith, by believing, by trusting, not by doing. For all those who do what? Who believe. For there is no distinction. What does that even mean? There is no distinction between the Jews who were trying their hardest and the Gentiles who never heard of Moses ever before. And so you have these Jews that Paul is visiting in Galatia, in Ephesus, in Corinth, in Colossae, wherever they might be. And these, these Gentiles, they would say, Moses who? I've never heard of him. And that's the whole point, is that God has come to us with this way that is not about us and our chasing. There's a lot of talk today about are you pursuing God? Are you following God? Are you chasing after God? Do you realize that God has chased after us? He has followed us through the cross and the resurrection. He has pursued us. So it's not about our chasing and our following and our pursuing. It's about receiving all that He has done for us. It's not what we do for Him. It's what He's done for us. For all have sinned a thousand times, a million times, a billion times. All of us in this room have sinned and we fall short of perfection. The biggest misunderstanding about Christianity is that God grades on a curve. The biggest misunderstanding about Christianity is, well, 
will see if I make it. God is working on me and will see if I make it. I'm in progress. Well, righteousness is not progressive. Rightness is not progressive. You either have been made right by faith or you're still trying. Have you trusted or are you trying? For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. You'll notice verse 24, being justified, which means made right, being made right as a gift by his grace through the redemption, which is in Christ Jesus. Now, isn't that awesome? The word gift. But I'll tell you, gifts make us uneasy. Do you ever feel uneasy about a gift? Someone gives you a gift and then what? There's that gulp in your throat, right? Well, this is great, but hmm, maybe I need to return the favor, right? Maybe I need to get them something now. And so we play the game of payback. What's interesting is that when the God of the universe gives you a gift, there can be no payback. There's no way to pay him back. And so we become, well, we get to this awkward, weird place of just having to be a receiver. Imagine a multi-billionaire knocks on your door and says, I would like to gift to you a billion dollars. At that point, you might experience some excitement. But you also might experience, well, some questions. Why? Why are you doing this? What's your motive? What's, what's going on behind the scenes here? What is this all about? And so when God does this for us, it begs questions. We come to the place where we say, why have you done this? And the reason he's done it is because there was no other way. There was no way to pay. He had to do it this way. We're justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. God paid a whole lot for you. The word redemption means he bought you. So will you be a receiver? Will you be in that humble place of receiving? And if you've already received him, if you're already in Christ, fantastic. You've received this status and that is awesome and that is great. But what a reminder of how we got here. And that it can never be taken. If it's free, it can never be taken. God displayed Jesus publicly as a propitiation in his blood through faith. This was to demonstrate his righteousness because in the forbearance of God, he passed over the sins previously committed. You see what this is saying? God displayed Jesus publicly. Do you know what propitiation means? Remember the definition of propitiation, satisfying sacrifice. God said, here's my son, a perfect sacrifice, a perfect blood offering so that you can be made perfectly cleansed and perfectly saved. And God demonstrated this publicly, mainly to show off his grace. He could have done it privately, you know, but he did it before a crowd he did it before people that didn't even understand what was going on. He did it to make a statement so that there would be witnesses of the way of grace. And even today, we are witnesses of the way of grace. Do you realize that? That you are a strange bird. I mean, you believe in a way that is, well, it's just counter to all of our culture. You work hard in the workplace in order to get promoted, in order to get a better status. In society, you're respected if you jump through certain hoops and do certain things, and then you're respected and honored. Well, God has done it all backwards, and you've realized that, that there's not a thing you can do to gain his respect. There's not a thing you can do to gain his favor. There's not a thing you can do to gain status before him. And so all of that cultural idea is turned upside down in the kingdom of God. For the demonstration, I say, of his righteousness at the present time so that he, God, would be the just and the justifier of the one who does what? Has faith in Jesus. Now, in a minute, we're going to see it's actually really hard, in a sense, for us humans as egomaniacs to have faith in Jesus. You tell me it's about faith, and I tell you, no, no, it's about works. You tell me it's about faith, and I tell you, oh, no, 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 it's about faith and works. And I resist 
and I push back, and I'm not willing, and I need to consider, maybe I'm different. Maybe I could do it. Maybe I could earn my status. Maybe I could try. Maybe I could get, get to God through what I'm doing. Maybe I'm an exception. And so the ego pushes back, doesn't it? And this is what the world is doing when they look at Christianity from the outside in. They're pushing back because of the issue of works. There are people that don't even know Jesus and their intuition, they've never even heard of the Son of God perhaps, and their intuition tells them that morality and ethics is the way. As early as the garden, Satan tricked them, giving them the knowledge of good and evil so that they would pursue good and not evil, and they would pursue morality and not immorality. And the way of ethics has tricked many. And what we're seeing is that there's another way. It's not about the way of ethics. It's not about the way of morality. It's not about the way of trying. It's about the way of trusting the one who has faith in Jesus. Does Jesus lead us to immorality? Of course not. But we have to start with Jesus to get the byproduct of Jesus. That is the mystery of it all, isn't it? That's the narrow gate. The narrow gate is narrow because people say, but what about? They say, but what about works? But what about fruit? But what about morality? But what about ethics? And the but what about causes them to be tantalized by the wide gate of performance religion. And in order to enter through the narrow gate, what did we have to do? We had to come to grips with the morality and the ethics that will come from me will now need to come from Jesus. I will trust him with the byproduct. I will trust him with the end result. But if he is the gate and he is the door, and if it's by trusting, not trying, then I will begin there. I will begin with trusting and see what happens. And have we been disappointed? Have we been disappointed, church? We began with trusting and were we disappointed unto this very day, Jesus Christ began a good work in us and he is carrying us on to completion and he's trustworthy. Where then is bragging? Where then is boasting? It is excluded by what kind of law? Of works? No, but by a law of faith. Do you see that how much bragging would be involved in this life? How much we could toot our own horn, how much we could beat our own chest, how much we would have bragging rights before others and maybe even before God if it was about our doing. But God has announced that there is no place for bragging because there is no place for doing to get right. If it's a gift, then all I can do is say thank you and I'm glad you received that gift and I'm glad you received that gift and I'm glad you received that gift. I received that gift too. And we had to come to that place of receiving, didn't we? And there's no place for bragging except bragging on Jesus. For we maintain, perhaps this is the most central verse of all, we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from works of the law. My relationship, your relationship, your rightness, your standing has nothing to do with what you're doing. Now, I know that we recognize this. I realize that many of us, the words that are coming out of my mouth are super familiar to you. Nevertheless, when we wake up tomorrow morning, do you find yourself ever falling back into the delusion that something that you're doing is going to contribute to what the God of the universe thinks of you. And so God's impression of you, we believe, is influenced by our actions. And the gospel is just crazy talk. <laughs> because the gospel takes all of that idea and spins it around and says, yes, there's a place for doing, and yes, there's a place for actions, but I want to teach you this weird way, this weird way of being okay with me, not by doing, but, but by what I've done. 
We maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from works of the law. Now we're going into, uh, we're going into Romans 4. Now to the one who works, his wage is not credited as a favor, but as what is due. In other words, if it were by working, if it were by doing, if it were by earning, then man, you'd just be getting what you deserve. Thank God we don't get what we deserve, right? I mean, you know, when we go to our workplace, we believe there's a certain salary that we should be getting. And when we don't get it, some of us, well, we just suffer under lesser. Others of us complain and see what happens. And so there's this sense of working and earning and deserving, right? And uh, so what Paul is saying is, if that were the system, then we would just be looking at God saying, well... Well, yeah, I mean, what should I expect? Salvation, yeah. I mean, hello, I'm working here. And so I would be looking at God as if I am a deserver. Instead of a receiver, I would be thinking I'm a deserver. And I'm not a deserver, and I have to be a receiver instead. Now, here's more of this crazy backwards system called the gospel. The one who does not work, is God telling you not to work? Wow. Hold on a minute. Let's read the whole verse. But to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited as righteousness. Do you realize that through the scriptures, the God of the universe just told you to not work? Now, it's not that there's ever any sort of absence of works later, but in order to get right with Him, and in order to stay right with Him, and in order to be in perfect standing with Him, we actually have to not work. Now, that's hard, right? For the type A personalities in this room, right? You want to do, you want to earn, you want to achieve. In fact, for all of us humans... This is a tough road because we're being asked to not work. What is it like for you to practice the art of doing nothing? I tell you, here comes a time for confessions. I struggle on vacations if there's not something to do, man. I mean, we went to the beach growing up and I would lay there and I would think, well, I mean, it's been 20 minutes. Um... And I'm still laying here, and the ocean is nice, and the sun is nice, and the sand, it's all nice. But give me something to do. I need like a, I want to hit somebody, or like give me a ball to kick, or give me a competition, or give me a sport, or give me something to achieve at and win at, right? Anybody else feel like that on vacation? You got to have something to do, or you go crazy? Yeah? Okay, two of you. That's all right. We're a rare breed. But that's what it's like for all of us spiritually to practice the art of doing nothing and to just lay there on the beach and say, I have righteousness credited to me. You put your toes into the sand, you wiggle them around, you're resting in Christ, you're relaxing with God. You're letting the sun shine on you. You feel the heat and the light on you. And you're just a receiver. And you say, I am as righteous as Jesus Christ. Because he made me that way. And I had to be that right. Because only that right gets into the kingdom. Nine out of ten doesn't get in the kingdom. Eight out of ten doesn't get in the kingdom. Only perfection gets in the kingdom. And he, by what he has done and all that he has prepared through the cross and the resurrection, I lay on that beach and I say, wow, thank you. I'm relaxing with God. I'm resting in Christ. I'm banking on all that he has done for me. Just as David also speaks of the blessing, think of that sunlight, that heat, the blessing on the man to whom God credits righteousness apart from works. Beautiful, isn't it? Blessed are those whose lawless deeds might be forgiven, 
could be forgiven, will be forgiven, maybe. No, blessed are those whose lawless deeds have been forgiven, whose sins have been covered. That's all that David knew back then, the idea of covering. In fact, the Lamb of God has taken away our sins forever. Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord will not take into account. Do you realize there's no sins in your account? If you've trusted Jesus, there's no sins in your account. The Lord will not take into account your sins. Well, finishing up here, the end of Romans 4, it says, speaking of Abraham, therefore it was also credited to Abraham as righteousness, good old Abe, now, not for his sake only was it written that it was credited to him, but for us today, for our sake also, to whom it will be credited as those who do what? Believe in him who did what? Raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. So, if it is not clear to you yet, in fact, I've had many requests, please sum up what does it mean to be saved what does it mean to be right? If you were to encapsulate what it is, what does that doorway look like? Based on all that we've seen today, here's what I would say. I would say that a person comes to rightness with God when it dawns on them and when they agree with a few simple things. Number one, Jesus Christ had to do it because I couldn't. Jesus Christ died on the cross to take away all my sins, not some of them, not progressively, but all of my sins once for all. Jesus Christ rose from the dead in order to gift me, freely gift me, freely give me eternal life. And so when I believe this about him, then I decide that he has authority to save me. And so I choose to open the door of my life and I receive him. And when he comes in, he does two things for me, two big things. Number one, he takes away my sins forever. Number two, he gifts me eternal life forever. And it's because of him not because of me. I had to be a receiver. Didn't you have to be a receiver? And so what we're seeing is that there's this unusual place where we have to receive from God instead of earn. Here it is summed up, everything I just said. Jesus was delivered over to death. Why? Because of our sins. And then he was raised. Why? because of our justification. So a lot of us Christians, we don't realize what this means, but what it means is he had to raise from the dead to make you right because you are right by resurrection. You are right by resurrection. Resurrection life is eternal life and you are right by resurrection. So you're not right by the cross alone. You're right because he rose from the dead. Do you see that? That you possess, as Romans says, we possess within us the resurrected Jesus, not uh, some moral ethical teacher from 2,000 years ago, but we possess the resurrected Jesus within us. He was raised for our rightness. All right, well, the last verse for today, the last and one of the best. Therefore, the conclusion of it all, Having been made right by faith, having been justified by faith, what's the conclusion? We have complete peace with God. Are you at peace with God? Do you realize how at peace with God you are? If you entered through the way of faith, if you entered by trusting instead of trying, then you are at perfect peace with God. Now that's something to really celebrate, isn't it? All right, the summary. Shut up. That's what the law says. The law shuts everyone up. No one is made right by works. Next, we're made right with God as a free gift of His grace. He died for our sins and He was raised to make us right. Conclusion, we have peace with God through Him. So I guess the application, the bottom line is, are you trying or are you trusting? All right, that's one, that's good. <laughs> Two, 
Three. Any trusters? Amen. All right. Yeah. So the way of trusting is the only way. The way of trying is a dead end. Are you trying or trusting? If you trusted at the beginning, and it's been a year, a decade, a few, are you still trusting or did you engage in trying? Do you realize the Bible says, just as you received him, so walk in him. It started with trusting. It continues with trusting. It ends with trusting. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to inquire of you. We don't want our opinions. We want truth. And if the truth is it takes believing and receiving, then we want to do that. Many of us have. There may be somebody here that just wants to say, I believe and I receive. I trust instead of try. I cannot do enough, and therefore I need the way, the new way of grace, the way of a free gift, the way of receiving. Father, we thank you for all that Jesus Christ has done. We cannot imitate it. We cannot add to it. We cannot pay you back. Instead, we humbly have to say, wow, and thank you. And that's what we do this morning, Father, as we look at all that your Son has done for us on the cross and through the resurrection. We say that wow and that thank you. And we celebrate the rightness that we have forever as a free gift. We thank you for the way of trusting. We thank you that it's the only way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.